and these types of force wreak havoc on perceived They need it from those around them, and they need it from themselves, because self-blame is present no matter what when it comes to, to um, sexual assault. But when you add victim cooperation to avoid danger, it introduces even more self-blame. The questions of, I should have fought, or why did I submit, or I agreed to do it, but if I hadn't, he would have, blank. Um, those are realities. <laughs> I also want to talk about um, what I like to call rapeable offenses. Um, I know people sometimes justify rape based on what the woman or the person was wearing, um, what they were doing prior, whether they were making out with the person, drinking, doing drugs. I don't care what you were doing. I personally believe there are no rapeable offenses. There is nothing you can do that deserves rape. Um, so that's where I stand on that. <laughs> I made up the word, but you can use it. <laughs> Every 98 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. Regardless of gender, the, between the ages of 12 and 34, you are at the highest risk for sexual violence, for rape and sexual assault. In general, seven out of 10 rapes are committed by someone known to the victim. It's not strangers. In fact, 45% were acquaintances, and 25%, when you break it down, are either spouses, former spouses, boyfriends, or girlfriends. Um, the majority of children and teen victims know their perpetrators. It's a little bit hairy in the statistics because for minors, they, they group it under sexual abuse as well. Um, but for that, 93% of the offenders were known to the victim. 59% were acquaintances, 34% were family members, and 7% were strangers. Rape is the most underreported crime. 63% of sexual assaults are not reported to the police. And the prevalence of false reporting is between 2 and 10%. Millions of women have experienced rape. Right now, it's an estimated 17.7 million American women. And, um, one out of every six American women has been the victim of rape or an attempted rape in her lifetime. Females ages 16 to 19 are four times more likely than the general population to be the victims of rape, attempted rape, or sexual assault. Women ages 18 to 24 who are in college are three times more likely, and women in that same age group who are not in college are four times more likely. Most rapes are planned, approximately 70%. When you get to college, the, um, the rates go up even more. It's actually one in four college women have been the victim of a rape or an attempted rape. And of those, 84% knew their attacker. 42% told no one. 5% reported it to the police. 98% of those rapes were men assaulting women. 27% of the women whose sexual assaults met the definition of rape did not identify their experience as such. 57% of those rapes occurred on, during dates, and 75% of the men and 55% of the women involved in those rapes had been drinking or taking drugs prior to the rape. Men are not immune. In the United States, there are an estimated 2.78 million men who have been the victims of rape or an attempted rape. That means one out of every 33 men, or when you just think about rape in general, one out of every 10 victims is a man. So what's the big deal? Why is this such a big deal when someone gets raped? There are long-term repercussions for the victim. 94% of women who are raped experience post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the same as what the veterans experience when they come back from war um, within the first two weeks following the rape. 30% experience PTSD symptoms nine months after the rape. 33% of women who are raped contemplate suicide. 13% of women who are raped attempt suicide. Approximately 70% of rape or sexual assault victims experience moderate to severe distress, a larger percentage than for any other violent crime. People who have been sexually assaulted are three to 10 times more likely to use drugs than the general public. And sexual violence also affects their relationships. They're much more likely to have strained relationships with family, with friends, uh, with intimate partners, um, and they're also at risk for pregnancy and STDs. So why is it important to know these facts? I believe that if you know the facts, you can be empowered and you can make informed decisions. 
Had I known the facts, I think I would have identified what happened to me as rape immediately. I think my response would have been vastly different. I was raped in the first month of my first year of college, which statistically was a time when I was at an increased risk. I was also raped during the months, or during a time frame when 50% of all college sexual assaults occur. I fell into the 27% who did not identify their experience as rape initially, and I also fell into the 84% who knew my attacker, and therefore um, I fell into the 95% or the 42% who told no one, and the 95% who didn't report it to the police. Um, I was also part of the 57% where it occurred on a date. I really thought that rapists lurked in dark alleys and that it was perpetrated by strangers and not someone who, would, who knew you and gained your trust. I also believe that I am part of the 70% whose rape was planned, unbeknownst to me. And as I came to terms with being raped um, and facing my rapist on a regular basis, I joined the 13% who attempted suicide. I fell into the 70% who experienced moderate to severe distress. And I hope that by sharing all these facts with you, you feel empowered to make better choices and that you share them with the women and men in your life and that you let them know that there are certain behaviors that can increase your risk um, and that you help prevent them from being a future statistic. And I hope too that you not only make wiser choices but that you advocate for not only yourself but your friends as well and that you don't let someone else be victimized. So good. All right, don't leave, don't leave. We're gonna, we're gonna keep you up here. Okay, so leaders, if you can go ahead and um, hand one of these out, what you guys are gonna get right now is one of these cards that was filled out by somebody in this room. It doesn't have their name. You don't know who filled it out, and it wasn't you. Even if all the ma answers match exactly your responses, it's not your card. We all know that, right? It's not your card. So when you respond the way I'm gonna ask you to, no one's gonna be like, oh my goodness, not you. They're just going to be like, wow, here's what, I, here's what I want us to do. I'm going to read off each of these. Look at the card. This has nothing to do with your personal answer to this at all. Zero things to do with your personal response to this. If you are holding a card that has markings on it, I want you to just do that. It's as if somebody who wasn't even here tonight did it. But, I, but it's important to know that it does represent somebody in this room. I want you guys to see how many other people, because if you said yes to some of this stuff, I want you to know you're not alone. We just talked about all these stats, and it's easy to hear that and just be like, oh, those are numbers. That's fun. But this card says, I, I felt pressure to do more physically than I'm comfortable with. If your card says yes, will you stand up? Look around. Some of you... Now, whoever's standing, that has nothing to do with whether or not they've experienced that. But somebody in this room has, this many people in the room, have given in or felt pressure to do something more physically than they were comfortable with. Somebody has, to some degree, coerced them. And they've felt that pressure. Now, the next one, you can sit down if the answer is no. If the answer to the second one is yes, stand up. I know someone who's given in to pressure to do more physically than they are comfortable with. Not just felt it, but they've given in to that. And I know somebody that that's happened to. That's more than half right now standing up. Go ahead and sit down if the next answer is no. Stand up if it's yes. I've given in to pressure to do more than I am physically, do more physically than I am comfortable with. The number's about half of what was just standing up. You guys, like a quarter of the students in this room right now have given into that pressure. That's not something against them. It's not their fault. He said, there's no rapeable offense. Your clothing does not give somebody else the right to take advantage of you. Your behavior, your actions, even like the T video showed. Even saying, oh, I'm down, and then getting in there and going, ah, never mind, does not give someone the right to take advantage of you. I've hooked up while buzzed, drunk, or high.
the numbers are lower. I'm thankful for that. I believe it was in the stats you shared that that, that increases the risk. Yeah. Notice it increases the risk, not the right. There's no right for someone to do this, but there are things that if you engage in certain activities, if you do certain things, ladies, if you make a habit of going to a bad neighborhood and getting in your car by yourself at two in the morning, you are increasing your proximity risk to somebody harming you. That does not give them the right to do so or mean that it's okay if they do something. But that puts you at greater risk. Be wise in where you are and what you're doing and what your surroundings are. But know too that it's not your fault and it's no, nobody deserves this. Go ahead and sit down. If it's no, the next one says, I've heard her said, if you really loved me, we would do this. Hmm. That one comes up a lot. You know what's interesting about this is it's a lot of different people. Not everybody who said yes to the other one said yes on this one. There are different people standing. Those are different cards. Go ahead and sit down. Next one. I feel like I don't have a clear boundary of where to draw the line physically. If it says yes on your card, stand up. Well, I'm kind of shocked at this one. All right. Go ahead and sit down. That, that wasn't a lot, but there were some people still where even personally, even without having to tell somebody else, and in the moment, I'm not going to have you guys raise your hand, but like in, in the moment, it's a lot harder to figure out what that boundary is, even if you've thought about it ahead of time. But if you have a plan ahead of time, it's a lot easier to hold to it. If you say yes to hooking up or having sex once, it means you are saying yes the next time too. Anyone... It seems that way a lot of times. Hillary shared in her story that she was convinced that that's how it was. I've already given in this one time. What's the difference now? Some people go ahead and sit down. Some people feel like that's how God looks at it too. Well, I already did that sin, so what the, what's the point? No harm. I've already, I've already broken that rule. But that's not how it works. I feel shame for past physical activity I have been involved in. Man. Regardless of whether, uh, go ahead and sit down. Um, regardless of whether or not that was you. To those of you who've said yes, or maybe you put no even when Maybe thinking about it, hearing all of this, you're like, oh, maybe I should have said yes to a couple things. That last one, shame, I want you to hear this so, so clearly. That does not come from Jesus. That does not come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts us, which is not the same as shame. The conviction of the Holy Spirit's purpose is to turn our eyes to Jesus. It's to make us recognize our need for a savior and bring us to that place of seeking forgiveness and grace. And it always comes. Shame is a tool of the enemy to keep you from lifting your eyes to heaven. Don't give in to that. Now, maybe that's not what you meant when you put shame. Maybe it was just like, well, I've done things I regret, but but there is so much shame associated with all of this. We could have made a huge long list and gotten into every sort of sexual activity and, and pornography and, and digital stuff and everything else, but we, we wanted to, uh, in, in particular, I wanted to kind of hone in on that, but just, and, and just to give you guys a little bit of a picture of like, man, look at who else has struggled. For those of you who said yes to one of those, there wasn't a single one that there was only one person standing. Whoever you are that said yes to any of those, you're not alone. You're not the only one. And even if you were the only one in this room, which you're not, not a single one of those questions was there only one answer. But even if you were, God is with you. He is for you. He has provided a way for hope and healing. Hillary's going to share it quickly. We're running a little short on time. Can, can you give us like the one-minute hope pitch? And then I'd, I'd love sure. to get to some of the questions and things before we run out of time here because there are some great questions that came in, and okay. I don't want to overlook those. 
Well, I just wanted to share that this, this past May marked 16 years since I wrote and delivered that letter. And I wrote a copy of that letter in my journal, and in preparation to share, I reread that letter. And I actually went through my entire journal, and I realized that every single prayer that I had written in that journal got answered. And every single complaint that really wasn't a prayer, but just me going on and on and on about my brokenness and um, the pain in my life, like God answered those prayers too. He is so faithful. And he answers prayers, he does miracles, and there's nothing that you can do or that anyone can do to you that God cannot redeem. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, that was awesome. He said quick. <laughs> she actually came through with the one minute version. Okay, that is awesome. Okay, um, all right, here we go. I'm gonna get to where uh, we have our questions here. All right, so um, some of the questions that have come, come in. Um, is, is there any, is any type of pressure with giving in and not putting up a fight still rape? And I, I would say absolutely yes. Like that, yeah. was, that was what you talked about in your story, yeah. right? Like, I mean, you, you, you said did. you were pressured by this guy and it was these threats. It was not yeah. physical. Well, the first time it was physical. Right, right. The but the second, second guy, time. the relationship, right? Oh, the second relationship? Um, yeah, I was just sleeping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I don't think that it's just the absence of no. You know, it... Right. It's, we, it's, like the, it's like the thing said. Even if somebody doesn't want to... And it doesn't have to be forced on you. Uh, sexual assault or, or um, coercion is yeah. still wrong. And it, the, the word rape has some specific definition to it, but the idea of sexual assault is much broader and still a valid injury against, against you. It, yeah. it's, not, it's not okay just because it's like, well, it wasn't technical rape because these particular criteria. No, it was still a, a brutal a, a attack and assault against yeah. you and your, your dignity and your honor, um, right? I yeah. Mean, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, uh, so rape falls under the umbrella of sexual assault. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, sexual assault is very broad and all encompassing. <laughs> I just want to make, we're uh, recording this, but we've got it angled so that it won't get y'all in here. Cause we didn't <laughs> want anybody to be like, Oh my gosh, the back of my head's in here. And we're talking about things. Um, but I just wanted to make sure it, it'll cut off. Um, it's, it's got the screen as like the frame and I, if Hillary's too far that way, she'll be off camera and then it'll just be in a disembodied voice sharing on the thing. Um, another aspect uh, or another question uh, that's part of this what about over social media what if somebody's pressuring you to send uh, inappropriate photos or nude photos or, or suggestive photos and yeah there can absolutely be coercion and in fact usually that's how that progresses um, oftentimes that's uh, where that comes from is somebody goes like hey well send me this and then well send me that and then it gets to where there's one that like seemed sort of innocent until they say like, you know, and they kind of hit the boundary. And I mean, I've read account after account after account of how this has happened and tr made people feel trapped. Mm. Where now it gets to the point where it's like, I sent one that like, I kind of felt like I was okay with until they were like, if you don't send me like full nude video or whatever, I'm sending this to your mom. And then it's like, uh, I would rather send another picture to this person than get them off my back then have my parents see that I sent them a picture with my shirt undone or something else, you know? And so then they do that. Then they want more there. Then, they, then it becomes, I'll send all this to the school or I'll send all this to all your friends or all my friends or your new boyfriend or your dad or whatever. And that escalates to the point where a couple of things there. One, it, you don't have to give in to that stuff. It's not okay and there's, there should be Anybody that's got to ask for that, it kind of ties in, like, that's the question we were kind of getting out, like, well, if you really loved me, you'd do this. If you really loved me, you'd send me pictures so I could see you anytime I'm thinking about you. Ah, be pure. Quit that nonsense. Take a nice selfie and smile at them. That, that should be enough. You shouldn't have to see that stuff anyway. Talk to Jesus about that. You can talk to us about that. We'll be talking about that more. But um, that aside, um, also... For those of you who have done that kind of stuff, 
know that um, in many states, it's a felony to have nude photos of an underage person, even if they are, if you're the same age and they are your significant other or your friend or whatever. In some states, most states, you can be charged with distribution of child pornography for sending that photo to other people. That's a federal crime. That can get you, like, people who get busted with child porn stuff, if they ever get out of prison, they'll be labeled a sex offender for the rest of their life. Sometimes they just go bye-bye and nobody ever hears from them again. I don't know what hole they put them in. But seriously, I mean, like, it's, it's big, freaky, important stuff. Don't mess with that. If that's, if that's been you uh, on either side of that, I'm sorry, but there's hope, there's reconciliation. You can overcome that stuff, but man, don't just leave it there. Um, okay, Hillary, this is one to, to help because uh, you, you've been in this spot. So what should you do if somebody confides to you that they got raped? How can you bring them hope? Well, I think for starters, if it just happened, make sure they're safe um, and offer to help them. Um, offer to drive them to the hospital, they should definitely get in touch with either, if they're not going to go to the hospital, they need to call the police, or they need to call the Southern Arizona Center Against um, Sexual Assault, which is uh, SACASA, um, or they can call the RAIN, has a like 1-800 number. Both those numbers are 24-7. I can give out those numbers. Um, and we, we, can we can have those, uh, yeah, we can later. throw those up on the screen at yeah. the end as well, and we can put up uh, some of that information. We can type that out, um, and uh, I, we'll put this with this video. But I would definitely say, believe them. Like, I think it's really powerful to say, I'm sorry this happened to you. I believe you. It's not your fault. Um, and acknowledge, like, they are struggling. This is huge. They just went through this traumatic ordeal and respect them in that. Mm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, give people the, the benefit of the doubt on something. Like she said, it's a severely underreported crime, so it's rare, if at all, that somebody's going to falsely make an accusation like that because there's a lot to it. Mm -hmm. But then along with that, if they're saying that, there's probably something more going on. If, if somebody's in a place where they're willing to make that false claim against somebody, the damage, the, the shame that they're gonna end up facing and dealing with in the midst of that, like, man, if that's not true, there's something else serious going on and, and somebody needs to get involved there and intervene. So if you, if you feel like that's the case, uh, or if somebody has explicitly told you that, please let somebody know. Um, along with that, somebody else asked, uh, what, if, what if you want to bring that up but that person has threatened you? So that's what if you want to confess or, or report somebody for rape, but that the rapist has threatened, threatened you? Um, call the police. <laughs> call the police. You can get a restraining order really easily, and yeah. I would definitely do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, know that just like with any other, um, not to take away the, the um, severity of sexual assault, but just like with any other bullying or victimization that people engage in, um, that threat of consequence is key to them succeeding and continuing to do this. Yeah. So removing that, facing that dead on, head on and just like, okay, I'm going to report this, make it known, let other people know. It, it's kind of like one of those movies where they're like, you know what we're going to do to like avoid the threat of like us dying? Like, you ever, like they, we're holding the key that will like bust everybody. And as long as they hold on to it and they're the only one who has it, all they have to do, all the bad guys have to do is like kill that person. And then they're like, you know, no more problem. Like, but if you let some people know and you report it to the authorities, that person loses all that hold of like, well, I'm going to do this. Like, yeah, it's going to be real con confusing to the cops if I said, hey, I was raped and then threatened by this person and then I report it and I show up, something happens or somebody's making anonymous threats. Like, I wonder who that was. Like, they're going to figure it out. It really, it, it's worth that. But trust me, the, the risk is much less than that person wants you to believe. That's why they're threatening you, because it terrifies them that you might speak up. Well, and once you have that restraining order, if they come anywhere near you, you right. call the police, they are arrested. Yeah. Um, so that threat is gone. Absolutely. Uh, what if it was a family member who assaulted you, Ugh. and you don't want to say anything because it was a long time ago, and you don't want to damage the family? I would say, man, bring it up. 
bring it up anyway. Don't leave that. Yeah. What, just let me throw it out. What if you weren't the only one? And keeping it a secret enables them to keep going. Most of the time, people don't do that as a one-off event. The people who do this are in a place where what they get out of that, it's, it's not a moment of confusion. It's not a moment of like, oh, I didn't mean to. It, there's something going on where they're getting something from that that's not about physical intimacy or sex or arousal. There's something else going on there that they will want or need again. And, and you could help protect somebody else if you speak up. It's worth it. Um, and, and I know people who have gone through that. And, man, I'm telling you, it's worth it. Uh, and it, it, for any of this stuff, if you guys, if there's something you need to report, if there's something that you need to do, know that um, your leaders are here for you, and, and I am as well. Um, we will be with you in this. We will walk beside you in this. We will not be like, ooh, well, that's dirty. And like, we're not going to do any of that. Like, we're here for you. And we will help you get through this, okay? Like, I mean, we, we genuinely care for you and, and want you to be okay. Um, okay, uh, there was a comment about um, what about when, um, you know, like when a man assaults a woman, it, it's fairly, you know, understandable to everybody that that's, okay, that's rape, he's bad, you're, you know, like, good for you. What about when it's the other way around and it seems like in our culture people celebrate that almost somehow. Like if a woman is taking advantage of a man, whoa, she's, you know, like confident and this and that. Mm -hmm. And like the guy can feel very powerless or unable to claim that. Like the, yeah. And I, I think it, can, it could be very emasculating as well to, to have to admit somehow that a woman took advantage. Like, like, oh man, I was taken advantage of by a woman. High five. But yeah that kind of thing. So how, can you speak into well, that at all? That's what happened to my rapist. Um, he was raped by a woman and that's why he discounted it altogether. And I completely disagree with that. I think it's just as valid. And I think if you come forward, you will get the help that you need. And people validate that now. I think, um, and I think it's very brave for men to come forward because I feel like it's really hard as a woman to come forward. I'm sure it's even harder as a man, but Hopefully, people will support you and embrace you and not judge you for that, yeah. just as any other rape survivor. Absolutely. Um, what about uh, is the, the question of, is it possible to be raped without it actually being sex, having sex? And I think I, I could be wrong, so maybe if you know, correct me, but um, like you said, rape falls under a broader umbrella of sexual assault. So even mm -hmm. if it doesn't qualify as rape, sexual assault any sexual activity, if that's manual or oral or, or oral intercourse or... Oral falls under rape. Oral does fall under rape. Yeah. Well, there you go. The, the definition of rape has just been redefined. Um, it used to just... That's awesome. Um, ...include women. So yeah. now it includes anyone, regardless of gender. And it's just um, any forced sexual activity, whether it's oral, vaginal, or anal. It does yeah. not matter. Um, yeah. So I, it's broadened. That, that's awesome. I, yeah. I didn't realize that. And um, I remember there was a story that came out a few years ago where um, hazing, uh, there's some stuff, and, and some of you guys who play sports may have experienced this, but um, uh, I know like on a football team I played on, I narrowly avoided the full completion of this prank, they called it, but it was called a super sit-up. And uh, they did some stuff that resulted in trying to do a sit-up with like a blindfold, like a towel over, and then you sat up with a guy's genitals or bald rear end right in your face and the goal was to and you know like ah, look what you just did technically that's sex sexual assault and uh that i mean that's sexual assault it was a dumb hazing thing that they all thought was a funny prank but it, that's sexual assault and there was an entire football team uh ncaa football team that was like Seriously, um, that, like they lost their whole program. They got in all sorts of trouble because of all the stuff that was going on in that way. And it got so bad that they moved on from that type of thing to actually physically and, and sexually assaulting 
the freshmen on the team. And, and then all these guys were, uh, you know, being brought up on charges and everything else. And, and there were some high school programs that had gotten really big. And that was a huge deal for them, too, where there were, you know, juniors and seniors uh, assaulting uh, the younger kids on the team and, um, or the weaker guys or the newer guys on the team. And, um, yeah, anything like that, any sort of that, even like sexual assault or, or uh, you know, can include social media or, or pressure to, uh, to receive this stuff, like, uh, um, or to give in. Pushing those boundaries can be uh, considered that as well. And, and especially um, in school, they're still trying to figure that out because it wasn't always such a big deal. But once you get into college and into the workplace, like, you can be fired and blackballed in your industry for um, sexual harassment, and the, the rules of that are so broad now, validly so, but, um, but it's so, there's not a lot of leeway. Like, if you are doing things that dishonor somebody else, just know that um, th that puts you in dangerous territory. But if you're receiving that kind of stuff, unwanted advances, we've talked to students here who have dealt with that. We've talked to students, uh, I've talked to students at schools and in, in, in previous ministries where um, they have dealt with that kind of stuff. Like, how do I say no? This person's not taking no for an answer. And guys, that, or ladies, that can be um, that idea of like not being willing to hear a no um, is not okay. Not in any scenario. People have the right to say no to things. You don't have the right to force or require anything of anybody. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, but yeah. Oh. Did I lose my mic? I don't know. Are you still? Yeah, I'm not hearing it. Um, also, under sexual assault, it includes um, exhibitionism. So if anybody exposes themselves to you, that is sexual assault as oh, well. Yeah. Right. yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, good point. Good clarification. Um, okay, last couple, and then um, I want to be able to uh, just just pray for a few minutes and, and connect, and then and then we'll close that. Um, what do you do if you are still um, if you are still in proximity to the person who raped or assaulted you? Like, what what would you say to somebody who is in close proximity? Like, if they're still living there, and that person, whether it's actively going on or not, that's got to be a horrifying experience and and uh, yeah. what what well, would you back. say oh you're back all right <laughs> nope. nope and we're gone <laughs> oh gosh so that was me for two years and i would never wish that upon anyone and i would say if you can get yourself out of that situation i would recommend it i think um <laughs> once once my rapist graduated um I, I was in such a better place. You know, that was the point where I had forgiven him as well, but I just felt this weight lifted off of me because it is really hard to live in their presence. Um, but I would definitely say people need to know that that person did that to you. So if you're living in this person's presence and no one is aware of it, you need to confide in someone. You need to report it. Um, you need to make it known to school officials, whom, whomever it is that's an authority that can help protect you. Um, you can still talk to the police. You can, you know, talk to your college pastor, talk to your coaches. Don't go this alone. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, absolutely. Speak up. We're here for you um, uh, to reiterate something that we've said previous times in the past. Um, at, Every one of your leaders, and myself included, Cody, Jess, everybody here, um, we are, one, we are for you. Two, we are mandatory reporters. If you tell us something, there is no option of like, hey, I'm going to tell you this, but you can't tell anyone. I, none of us can ever promise that. Um, that's part of our, uh, it's state law in Arizona. We have to tell somebody if there is some form of abuse or something else. And sexual assault and this form of abuse absolutely qualifies. It's one of the biggest reasons why there are mandatory reporting laws. Um, because we don't want it to be safe to tell somebody and not do anything about it. And then something escalates or something gets worse. Like Hillary said, the results of this stuff, none of it was good. She didn't go like, well, I felt really beautiful because he wanted me so much. He didn't wait for me to say yes. That's never part of the way this goes. It's, 
It damaged her self-worth. The words she was using when she was talking were, she, she felt undateable. She felt disgusting. She felt unlovable. She, uh, it, the self-worth was just gone. And everything she said, there was no right to stand up for herself. There, there's no, it removes all of these things. It totally erodes all of that um, idea that you're worth enough to stop this. But I'm telling you, you are. You are made priceless in the image of God. You are a beautifully and wonderfully made creation, men and women alike. No matter what your past has been, no matter what ha- happened to you, whether you chose it or not, You are not worthless. You are not unworthy of love, and in particular, God's love. And because of his love for you and his love for me, despite everything I've done, man, I love you guys. We love you guys. We are here for you. And if you're suffering from shame and guilt and a lack of self-worth, if you're struggling with depression, whether it's from any of this or anything else, she meant, Hillary mentioned helplessness, um, getting into self-harm and cutting um, hopelessness, just feeling like there was just no way up or out of this. The fear, constant fear. Getting to the point where she was self-medicating and ultimately suicidal over this. And the thing is, is the, the first guy she mentioned was raised Christian and the other guy was a PK, right? He is a pastor now. Man, it, don't think that just because they had something to do with church or they claimed that, that what they do is okay. Sin is sin. Um, man, you guys, but there is healthy, amazing, wonderful, loving relationships available for you. And if I can, ju- we're, we're out of time, so I, I can't go into all the details. We'll talk about it more soon. But I, I want you guys all to hear this. There is more for you than whatever physical pleasure you will get out of any relationship now. Wait till marriage, not just for intercourse. But my, my challenge to you is I would recommend while you're in high school, try not, what if you, like what harm would come to you if you never even kissed another person? I, that sounds ridiculous. But I tell you what, my buddy Matt, he'd never been kissed until his wedding day in his 20s. And I tell you what, one thing his wife was not sad about was whether or not he had kissed any other women. She was stoked because he knew one day he was waiting for that. He was waiting for her. You know what, I like, I mean, these are good friends of mine. You know what else she's never said? Man, it's unfortunate that he didn't get more practice in because he was pretty terrible at this at first. Like that first kiss was a little bit awkward, but he'd watched enough movies, he'd figured it out. (laughs) He knew how to do it. Turns out it's a pretty natural thing. All those things, everyone, our culture thinks somehow you've got to practice before you get into the real thing. No, you don't. It does zero good positive things for you. Study after study after study is showing the more and more you are physically intimate with people before marriage, the less likely your marriage lasts. Statistically true. The one factor that's a significant difference is an active and thriving Christian faith that has involved a huge amount of repentance and life change in Christ. Not just people who claim to be Christian, but when they dig in and find that there are indicators that this person is actually living out a Christian life with a real relationship with Jesus, that that does make a significant difference in those statistics. But just claiming to be a Christian or just going to church once in a while actually affects it zero. But you guys, God has a better plan for you than just making out. You're not missing out on much. Just leave all that alone. Focus on intimacy in a healthy way, in good friendships, in finding out what kinds of personality things you like being around and that kind of thing. And, and don't engage in this kind of stuff. It's amazing how much of this kind of risk of the like, well, was that coercion? Was that not? Is that a thing? If you don't put yourself in those situations, you remove some of the risk. Never is there a right for someone to do this. Putting yourself at risk does not make it your fault. 
but you can be a little safer, a little wiser by taking wise steps and avoiding um, sexual immorality, put it. All right, you guys, uh, there's hope, frustration, and healing. Look at Hillary. She's got a beautiful family, and she's an amazing woman who is sharing the light of Christ through her story. Will you guys give her another round of applause? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to pray for her and pray for us, and then we are done. And you guys can hang out and or leave as you're ready. Okay? Here we go. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity for us to hear Hillary's story. I pray that you would continue to shine your light through her, that any, any residual shame or, or doubt in, in the testimony and the story that you have given her, that you would shine light on that and, and boldly remove that darkness of, of shame and, and self-doubt that uh, I thank you for the restoration and healing that you've brought to her, that you have brought about reconciliation to the point where she has a family, a, a solid marriage, amazing kids, and she has a testimony of the glory of God to overcome even the deepest hurts, even the, the most shameful uh, attacks, and that uh, she has found a way to share your love and light with those uh, who would listen to her. I pray for each of these students that they would find righteousness and an intimate relationship with you to be valued above all else, that the young men in this room would hear that call to honor the women they are around, to, to defend their honor fiercely, and to not give in to the temptation for momentary pleasure at the sacrifice of honor and righteousness and purity. I pray for the women in this room that the same would hold true for them, that they would defend their own honor and the honor of the young men around them, that they would not give in to the societal pressures to engage in things that um, would in any way remove that. But God, I pray that every single student in this room, every adult leader in this room would know that there is absolute healing, forgiveness, and restoration in you, and that there is no point at which they can out -sin your grace. And wherever they've been, is not where they are called to be. And God, you can bring them up and out of that and through and beyond that into a place of amazing testimony and righteousness because we get to wear your righteousness, Jesus, not our own. And I'm so grateful for that personally. I know that I have earned my fair share of unrighteousness and uh, that you have uh, clothed me in yours and I don't have to live with my sin, but I get to re revel in your light and love and that's true for everybody in this room and every person on this earth who would claim faith in Jesus. Help us to be bringers of that light to this world, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Hey, you guys, thank you for being here. We love you all. And uh, please continue asking questions, uh, speak out, and uh, let's... Um